Four court cases and 91 charges against him, a constant stream of anti-democratic statements from him, and a robust American economy that would normally blunt any real opposition, and still Donald Trump is tied with or beating President Joe Biden in most polls. How? Why? I wanted the view from someone who used to be on the inside of the Republican Party before being famously ejected. I'm talking about former Republican Representative Adam Kinzinger, once a rising star in the GOP who was effectively chased out of Congress with torches and pitchforks after he dared to vote to impeach Donald Trump after January 6th. Now, for the record, Kinzinger is still a Republican and a relatively conservative Republican at that. But it is a respectful, fascinating conversation. All Trump, Gaza, Ukraine, abortion, and the Supreme Court. I hope you enjoy our chat. Congressman, thank you for joining us. Do I call you, you Congressman? Can, you call me whatever you Adam. want. I mean, if, if you're feeling formal, <laughs> but if you're feeling like a buddy, which you are, Adam's just fine, man. That's great. Yeah. Okay, well, I have to, I've got to ask you this. I'll call okay, you Congressman perfect. and then That's Adam good. sometimes. But let me ask you about, <laughs> about uh, the former president losing his appeal um, yesterday uh, to move the venue uh, to try to get this thrown out, to delay. It seems like this may be his last delay when it comes to this particular yeah, case. Yeah, I mean, what it looks like it is. I mean, everything he is doing, and I think, you know, it does bear repeating because not, you know, we know this, but not everybody knows it. Every, every move he does, every appeal, every motion is all about delay. It is all about delaying till after the election. And so, yeah, it seems like this was pretty summarily rejected and I think that's going to lead to, you know, we're going to see a trial. This isn't the trial I would have liked to have seen first. But at the same time, uh, I'm one of these that believes that nobody's above the law. And, you know, whichever comes first comes first. And so I think he's I think he's uh, he's certainly going to have to face justice either way in this one now. Which one did you, I, you want know, to see personally, first? Personally, I think, <clears throat> well, I'm kind of mixed. So I wanted to see the January 6th one first just because, to me, that's like, you know, the most important. It's essential that... The American people, you know, they saw a lot of stuff on the January 6th committee, but basically Department of Justice has been able to take a lot of what we had and even run with it. And they have more tools to compel. I think that's the most important for democracy. The second case I would have liked to have seen in rank and importance and not much lower in importance is the classified documents case. This is one, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I, the, the people I talk to say this is the one that's probably the most open and shut. I think it shows a reckless disregard for American foreign policy, for American secrets. And this to me is like, you know, people that kind of look back fondly on the Trump administration as if he was some magician with foreign policy. He was terrible on foreign policy, by the way. But I think this is important to show them like, look, not only was he not good on foreign policy, he didn't care about the secrets that America had that were earned by a lot of intelligence assets put their life on the line. So I guess that's how I'd rack and stack them probably. Uh, so wherever they go, where I guess you, you're you fine with it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. you know, it's the justice yeah. system. I, I, I'll tell you, I'm still disappointed that, you know, on the January 6th committee, we, we had our first hearing in that whole series of hearings, obviously over the summer. And we certainly sensed that right after that first hearing, DOJ was like, oh, crap. You know, we certainly need to pursue this. They have information we didn't know existed. They can point it pretty closely to the president. And it felt like, and I think it's obviously accurate, that that's when the DOJ investigation kicked off. Had they actually been doing this at the same time mm -hmm. we were, I mean, we would have had all these cases adjudicated by now. <clears throat> uh, let's talk about Letitia James. I'm sure you've been following this, the $174 million bond. She is questioning whether this assurity company, right, the, the, that it's supposed to ensure... <laughs> This, that Donald Trump is going to pay this money, that they don't even have the money, and they're not actually promising to pay it if he indeed yeah, defaults. Yeah, this, this is what's, this is like just the, this is the standard with Donald Trump, is like, you know, everything is a fraud, or everything is like in the gray area. And so that's what's interesting. Obviously, I had never heard of this country, this company, but I'm not really in the, what are they, kind of the weird insurance business or something like that. I've, you know, I've never dealt yeah, with that. Yeah. I don't know how they prove it. I guess that's my question is, 
how do they prove that they have the assets that they'd be willing to pay? Is it just, could I have formed an LLC and then, you know, insured Donald Trump? I, I don't know how this works, but it's... It, <laughs> They're not even insured in, in, in the state of New York to be able to do something uh, like this. is one of those fast cash, yeah, I forget like, what they call them, you know. But and the question things, is like, yeah. I, I, I guess I don't know. Does the court have the ability to then go in and investigate if this company is legitimate? Will they do that? Are they just going to move on? But again, I think the bigger story on this is just it's this is just standard Donald. This is Trump University, right? This is just standard Donald Trump. Yeah. But people still are yeah. giving him money. I mean, he got $50 million over the weekend. Why are rich people, and even not so rich people, poor people, why are they continuing to give him money? And what do you think of that $50 million? First off, from the the, well, let me say, I'll, I'll address the actual 50 first. I think it's a lot of it is smoke and mirrors. So I'll tell you, when I was in Congress, this was an annoyance. Like, I had fundraisers that would, you know, obviously I'd do a fundraiser and they'd come in and they'd want to, inflate the numbers of what they raised for me, you know, cause it makes them look good. And they were good fundraisers, but I would see like, you know, so-and-so gave $4,000, so-and-so gave 5,000. And I'd look back and be like, wait, I already got a, a like a, a letter from you saying that so-and-so gave $4,000, but then you actually took the check in at that. So then you double counted it. And then the other thing is that includes direct contributions to Donald Trump money to Donald Trump's super PAC. Probably they counted everything given from January here and then probably a lot of commitments forward. So if somebody said, hey, look, Donald, I'll give you five million over the your super PAC, five million over the course of this election, they probably counted it at that event because Donald Trump made it clear he wanted to beat Joe Biden. So still a lot of money. And what I would put on it is it's a cult. And I think when you look at when you look at <laughs> <laughs> particularly those on a fixed income, right? These are the ones I'm most concerned about. Billionaires can spend their money how they want. But the people that are like on social security, they have been convinced, Don, that, look, if I convinced you that I was the only thing that stood between you and certain death or like you and the end of mm -hmm. your life, basically, you would part with anything, no matter how much or little money you had. And so what they do is they feed these people's dopamine system and then get them to give them their $100 out of their social security check because they truly fear that their children are going to die somehow if the Democrats win. And it, it it's is. like a phone scam when they target it's elder elderly abuse. people, it, that's, right? I'm glad you said that. It is elder abuse. There is no, in my mind, although it's legal, in, in theory, elder abuse is legal. If you have a caretaker that convinces a senior citizen to give up their assets to them, you know, the big challenge is like trying to take that to court because the person is of sound mind. I think this is elder abuse in many cases. And uh, on the billionaire side of it, look, it's, you know, Donald Trump is a transactional person. He knows how to promise these billionaires that any money they give him will be compounded in what they get back in tax benefits or access or anything like that. And it's a flaw in our uh, election system, and I wish it didn't take a constitutional amendment, but it's going to take a constitutional amendment to fix. Well, this listen, uh, this billionaire investor, John Paulson, set this record. He had this event at his Palm Beach home. He set a record for, I think, $25 million. Um, it doubles the $25 million that, uh, that Joe Biden got in his campaign when he was in New York with all the, the former president. So you're saying even that is a scam, and you're calling it elder abuse. Where does it, doesn't it stop, stop with Donald Trump? I mean, he's, and, look. I, I, and I, he cares about one thing. He cares about himself. That's it. Himself. And, you know, yeah. and there's a, there's a real impact to the country on it. I mean, look, honestly, if I knew if I was running for reelection and I knew that there were, you know, people that were giving, you know, driving a, an Uber shift <laughs> and then giving me the money from the Uber shift, I, I wouldn't want that to happen. I just wouldn't like, I would, I have a bit of a sense of like, I would feel bad about that. And, and he doesn't. So that's what it comes down to. But I think, I think, you know, Joe Biden will continue to out fundraise him. What I'll look for in the next few months is what numbers does Donald Trump report? Has he taken that 50 million? Has that kind of loaded a lot of the money that is going to come and we'll be able to tell that over the next few months and see if the 50 million was a scam or if there's really you know people that are willing to part with that kind of dough behind him
You seem more adamant. Adam, <laughs> adamant, Adam. <laughs> it's gonna be, that's going to be your new name. You seem even more adamant than in the months since I've spoken to you about this. I mean, do you still consider yourself a Republican? I do, only in that I refuse to give up. Like, you know, I, I think it's important to have people that are fighting. I got to tell you, I feel you. I feel you. You refuse to cede yep. that territory. That's right. And, and it's like, look, if I left the party, okay, and I said I'm a Democrat or I'm, not, I'm nothing, and then I was critical of the party, people would take that with about as much impact as anybody who was not a Republican attacking the Republican Party. That's just standard ops. I think it's important. Look, I haven't changed. I mean, I've moderated on a lot of issues, but that's because of age and that's because of maturity not because right. I wanted to belong to a right. different tribe. So I'm going to keep it. Now, I didn't vote Republican in the last election, and I don't intend to vote Republican in this election, but I haven't changed. They have. Now, that said, there's going to be a point at which I'm not going to just sit here and hang on to being a Republican if they continue to be the party of authoritarianism. Well, you know that happened to mm-hmm. Anna Navarro. That happened to who else is uh, we know that um, that happened to Kurt Bardella. It happened to a number of people. Uh, and, and look, I know Liz Cheney uh, is still a Republican. Liz Cheney was even oh, more yeah. conservative than you. But uh, it's interesting to see you guys in, in this position. So it happens a lot. So if it continues to go on, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave the Republican Party? Become yeah. independent or a Democrat? Yeah, I mean, look, I think if... So let's go through this election. Let's say Donald Trump wins. Don't dodge my Democrat question. Oh, no, I'll on. get to it. Uh, trust me, I'll get to it. Let's say Donald Trump wins or, you know, whatever. Let's say he even loses and the party continues to go in this direction. Uh, there's a point at which maintaining a Republican label just makes me a fascist, and I'm not a fascist. Wow. And so, yeah, at that point, I, I'm not addicted to the name Republican. I'll either be an independent or a conservative Democrat. I mean, I'd be willing to be a conservative Democrat. I don't care about the party label. You know, that used, that's an identity for so many people. It's, and it was an identity for me for a while. Uh, But I just want this country to like be successful. I just want people to like, you know, do politics, have our differences and live your life. Right. Like just have kids, be happy. That's it. I would have to considering the last couple of years, especially during Donald Trump, I, you know, I, I'm an independent, mm-hmm. but a conservative Democrat, if you could put me in a category, I think that was it. I don't think people understood that, especially when I was on CNN, and I don't think they understood it, understand it now. And I, don't, I especially don't think Elon Musk understood that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which we'll talk about. Stand by for that. But I want, I want to stick on this topic, because, and I want to read, because it's important that I get it right. Um, I'm wondering what the, you know for what that money that that they're going to use for, and what Donald Trump is going to do if he gets back into office. I want to talk about this uh, Project 2025 mm-hmm. and what's happening behind the scenes because I know it's very concerning. It's a proposed system of policies for a second Trump term. It's created by a number of close allies, Trump allies, including his senior advisor Stephen Miller, the former chief of staff Mark Meadows, Turning Point USA founder Charlie Kirk, as well as a number of others. Now. Let me just tell you what they're proposing. It has been reported by the Washington Post and others that one policy under consideration is Trump using the Insurrection Act of 1807 to activate the military for domestic law enforcement, as well as directing the DOJ to target Trump adversaries and then getting rid of certain institutions, a number of sweeping changes, including dismantling the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Education and the Department of Commerce. And it also includes banning abortion pills and pornography nationwide. <laughs> that is, uh, look, it's, it's, uh, it's not funny, but it's laughable yeah. as you are laughing about it. Because if that, if that indeed happens, that's, that is the end of democracy. What do you think of it? I agree. So here's the funny thing. So growing up in Congress, like, you know, all of those, with the exception of like the, abor- <laughs> we never even talked about abortion pills or pornography, but that's like the thing now. But all of those issues at some point had come up with the exception of like dismantling FBI and stuff. And it was always seen as this like kind of pipe dream of Republicans to get there, but we could never get there. Well, what's happened is, Don, you know, they learned, especially through January 6th, a lot and with, the, with this Insurrection Act, a lot of the power that the president can have that we knew the president could have it, but because of how we've always governed because of all these decencies, because of, you know, standards or whatever, like nobody would have ever think a president would tradition. Yeah. Tradition would ever do the insurrection act to go after his enemies. 
But now we have gone beyond where there's any sense of decency. You know, the former president now has the January 6th, quote unquote, hostages who are prisoners, um, you know, singing the national anthem. So nothing is off limits. The Insurrection Act was is a, is a very frightening thing to me because I think if he if he does incite the Insurrection Act, if he does go after his enemies, what, what's our options at that point? Well, we can hope that the military wouldn't carry it through, although technically it would be a lawful order. We can take it to the Supreme Court. Well, the Supreme Court's very strict constitutionalist, and they'll say, well, if Congress doesn't like it, they should change the law. This is a real concern. Now, I don't think they're going to get all of this done. Let's be clear. <clears throat> I think the best case scenario is you'll have a very inept government for four years. But the worst case scenario is they get a lot of this done. And what happens then? Democrats take power someday. And then what do they do? They do the same thing, maybe, because they're, I don't know. But this is how democracy falls apart. Because, Don, the only thing you need for democracy to survive is just a basic trust a basic compact with everybody that you can vote, your vote counts, whoever gets the most votes wins. When you start doing things like that, that basic compact goes away and you cannot, you cannot self-govern without that, that basic trust. How can Republicans and people who say, you know, and I think Donald Trump claims to be, doesn't he carry around the Constitution or something like that? How can they, how can they claim to be strict constitutionalists? Here's the weird thing. I don't think... This stuff? I don't think they do anymore. I mean, you think they, they believe in the Constitution. I, I think they believe. I think they'll tell you they do. Now, now this isn't every Republican. You know, rank and file Republicans. I think still in their heart do. But let's take a Marjorie Taylor Greene, or let's take a Charlie Kirk. It. They've basically said this now. It's all just about power to them. It is all just about taking, seizing the instruments of government and taking power. Um, Barbara Walter wrote a book called How Civil Wars Start. And what you see is when a majority ethnically or racially tends to lose power, that's when you start to see authoritarian grabs by that group because they start to realize they can't win elections fair and square. So now they try to do that through power means. I think you're seeing the beginning of that. And that's why it's important we talk about it because I think people have to be aware that this is what's going on, not to scare them not to just elect one person to the presidency or another, but so that they can see these things develop and push back against them in their own way. Is the average Republican, the traditional Republican in Washington right now, are they powerless? Are they, do they have any power? I hate to use the word impotent, but you, you know, I'm not, I'm not using it in, in the, in a sexual term, but yeah. do they, what happened? How do they feel sitting there watching you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and um, Matt Gates and all the chaos and trying to get rid of Mike Johnson and getting rid of Kevin McCarthy. How do they, what are they feeling? They hate it. They hate it. I I've talked to them. They all hate it. Um, that's why so, so many what do of they them, do? That's why so many of them are leaving. Here's the problem. Like, are they powerless? Yes. Are they impotent? Yes. But it's only because they choose to be. So let me give you an example. Okay. If you, me, and eight of our friends sat in a room and I pulled out a box of hand grenades, okay? And I gave everybody a hand grenade. We all, live hand grenades, we all would be the, of equal power. It'd be a dangerous situation, but we'd all have the same power. Now, if one of us was actually willing to pull the pin on that grenade, we become the most powerful person in the room. That's what you have right now with the Marjorie Taylor Greens. They're pulling the pins on these grenades. They're doing things that nobody ever thought Anybody would ever do dropping motions to vacate voting against rules on the floor that govern debate, which we never, ever voted against in the past, um, you know, doing these kinds of things. The problem is the only way to push back against mm. this is to have somebody else in the room willing to pull the pin as well and either blow everybody up or call their bluff. And so far, these powerless Republicans have been unwilling to do it on the Ukraine issue. Just two Republicans can go to the speaker and say, we're going to vote against every rule. And again, a rule is required for any floor action. We're going to vote against every rule that comes up unless and until you put Ukraine on the floor for a vote. He would do it in a week. He'd have no choice. But that's pulling the pin on the grenade. That's the problem. What happens then? I guess nothing happens? Well... Until until the, are you saying that they don't have the backbone or the spine to stand yeah. up to these guys? Yeah, at this point, yep. And uh, now this, 
on specifically on Ukraine. We'll see what develops over the next few weeks. But I mean, look, Mike Gallagher is leaving. He's not shutting down the floor. He's got nothing to fight for. Mike Turner and Mike McCall went on CNN and said Russian propaganda has infected the Republican Party. They're not going to the speaker and saying they're going to shut down the floor. So there's got to be a point at which they either get so fed up or you just let the crazies run the asylum. And that's the moment. You know what's weird, Adam? As I'm sitting here listening to this, like those things that, you know, back in 2016 that I was warning about and people were saying, oh, my gosh, you're a big lib. Right now, traditional conservative Republicans are saying the same thing. And you cannot call them libs. Right. You cannot call them lefties. You cannot call that, you know, say that they have MAGA derangement. Yep. And so make it make sense for me. It doesn't. I mean, it's it's the the fact is there. And I wish I could even point it back to where this started. You know, I wrote a book, Renegade, and my point in it wasn't to talk about me, but it was to kind of show over my time in politics where a lot of this started and what's happened on the macro scale. Uh, in, in terms of politics. But look, I remember in 2015, I don't know if you remember the name Dana Rohrbacher. It was kind of a... Yeah. Yeah. So he was on foreign affairs with me and we would... Tara would Tara set my work with Dana Rohrbacher? What's that? I didn't Tara set my work with Dana Rohrbacher? I think I think yeah. did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. I think... Yeah. In fact, I think Another so. former Republican. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, but Dana was always pro-Russia. And I would argue mm. with him on the committee. And this, like in 2015, people would say to me, Adam, just lay off Dana. He's probably paid by the KGB, like whatever, right? Now everybody's that way. And what I've learned, the reason this has happened is usually the most extreme voice pumps the most dopamine. The most dopamine mm. addicts the base, and the base keeps needing that pump and that hit of dopamine. And the only way to do that is to convince them that Don Lemon is a huge liberal who's coming to get them. Adam Kinzinger is a huge rhino. It's to put fear in them. That's why. That's how. You're not suggesting that people are being paid by the Russian money, are you? Uh, no. We were curious about Dana Rohrbacher, but who knows? We'll <laughs> is never Russian know that. money in- infecting the party, though? Members of the party? I think it's. I think it, it's infecting in a way. The money is infecting in a way, kind of around. The party. I don't think there's probably really anybody or many getting money directly from Russia, but obviously there's a lot of Russian money that's going into things like Twitter and uh, and getting out that information. Oh and so you see these trolls that are popping up. And that's what there was this recent study that came out that like basically back in August or September, there was a influx of Russian trolls when it came to Ukraine and the Ukraine aid. And that's actually what then slowed it down in Congress, because you get this sense, you know, if you look at your own social media accounts and you look at the comments, I post something and then everything calls me a rhino under it. I get the sense that the entire country hates me. I know that's not the case, and it's not but, true. but that's right. And that's so all of a sudden you post like save Ukraine and every comment says you're a rhino. Russia's going to win. You know, <laughs> people are just like, fine, then I'm going to back out. Well, at least I'm not alone then, because, you know, you walk down the street and everyone's like, hey, Don, I love you. Even people yeah. are like, I don't agree with you. But then you go on Twitter and, and we're going to interview someone who did a study on Russian bots and, and bots on social media and especially Twitter. And yes, there is, you know, there is credence to it. There's evidence that that is happening. But totally. you have to remember, Twitter is not the world, right? It, right. It's a little nutty. And let me uh, give by you the a, way, a real quick example. If you worked at the McDonald's customer service line. The only calls you would get are the terrible food that somebody got, right? If you go to McDonald's and you get a Big Mac you love, you're not calling the customer service line. Kind of the same thing. It's a bit of a skewed reality. I think I, I, think I know what I'm going to have for lunch now. Thank you for that because I haven't even eat, eat, eaten breakfast. Uh, speaking of, since we were talking about Twitter, I'm, I'm going to move on and talk about uh, Joe Biden and what needs to be done and you know what happens in the election. But I saw that you posted something regarding um, Elon Musk, and you couldn't believe that he couldn't sit there and take basic, simple questions from me without becoming upset. Yeah, look, you, I, I was I was watching. I actually tried to put myself kind of in Elon's position, and like, how would I react to Don? Nothing. You, I mean, it wasn't hostile. It was like a good journalistic interview. You you weren't like you know why are your shoes stupid. It was like, and then even when he got upset, you, you, you weren't like, you didn't double that. You're just like, why are you upset right now? Like, let's get into the, he couldn't handle it. Here's what happens, Don. I know a lot of billionaires from my time fundraising 
Um, when you, if you're a millionaire, for whatever reason, your friends will still tell you when you're doing stupid stuff, right? When you become a billionaire, you surround yourself with everybody that just reaffirms that everything you're doing is great. It's the same thing dictators deal with. So I call it the interstate of life, okay? If you're driving down the interstate... And all of a sudden, you know, you show up and you're wearing a bright pink shirt and orange pants, okay? And I'm going to say to you, Don, that shirt looks stupid with those pants. You started to veer off the interstate, and I am your rumble strip. And you're like, oh, yeah, this does look stupid. Boom, back on the interstate. When you're a billionaire, you don't have a rumble strip. So now you start veering off. You show up in a pink shirt and orange pants. Nobody will tell you it looks stupid, so you think it looks great. Now you're going off into the ditch, And next thing you know, you're wearing a duck on your head to lunch and nobody's telling you otherwise. (laughs) And so when you're Elon Musk and everybody sits around you and they tell you how awesome you are and how great your stuff is. And I mean, the guy's a talented dude. You can't deny that. Um, And then somebody challenges you even in a basic way. It seems to you it's because your mind is so skewed like a hostile interview when it's not. Yeah, that's exactly. Well, what I said was when, um, you know, and you know. It's, I, I'm not saying that you being on CNN is going into the you know enemy territory, but you go into the lion's den. You go into a place that is that you hear other voices. Yeah. So I admire like when Pete Buttigieg goes on Fox News mm-hmm. and challenges them, or when you came on CNN and you give a different perspective. That so I wanted to go on X and do the same thing. Mm-hmm. But the the odd thing is is that it's such people are in such echo chambers, right. Adam, that when they do hear a different perspective, uh, they feel attacked by it. And so, and yeah. so maybe you don't really want to hear a different perspective. Maybe it's just um, lip service. That's yeah. so, you know, I, I think we're saying the same thing. Can we move on now? Have you sure. Said everything yeah. you want to say? I'm okay. Good. Let's move on. Okay. So let's talk about the presidential election because Biden appears now to be stabilizing. It's within the margin yeah. of error, uh, average 1% of Trump. November, we're barreling towards November. How do you think this is going to shake out? Man, look, if the election were today, I think Trump would win. I think he'd win by less than what it would have been a couple months ago. I think, you know, here's the thing. Why do you think he's going to win? Just the state polls. The state polls. And the reason I think why is because people to this point. You're not saying he's going to win. Let me rephrase that. Why do you think if the election was held today that he would win now? If it was today. Because, look, over the last four years, yes, Donald Trump has been in the news, but not as a governing entity. He's been in the news, you know, just everything else. And people's memory of his time in, in, in the, as president, for some reason, you know, when you think in the past, all you remember is the good stuff, right? You think of a failed relationship you had, and you're like, oh, we had you such You romanticize a good the past. Totally. We all do. So I think that's a little of what's going on. You know, people feel miserable right now. But I think Joe Biden did a <clears throat> really big thing to ble- to stem the bleeding, which was I think his State of the Union address changed a lot because he showed a lot of energy. If you've noticed since the State of the Union address, there has not actually been a lot of this feeling that Joe Biden is unable to form a sentence or that he's just this bumbling guy. And so you've seen that kind of come back. And Donald Trump, like the way you win as a challenger is to make the race about the incumbent. Now, obviously, Donald Trump is an incumbent, but not really in this context. It's Joe Biden. But Donald Trump is doing everything he can because he can't resist it to make this race about him. And if he makes it about himself, then I think he'll lose because people will be watching and going, man, this guy's crazy. I I now remember the drama that we lived under with him. But I think it's going to be a tight race. I think it's going to be a tough race. I think it's going to be a tight, tough race uh, as well. I think the latest, what was it, Reuters poll, looking at approval numbers, uh, Biden's approval rating was at 46%, which is, you know, that's better than I think it was. Trump approval rating was at, is at 42%. Uh, percent. So, right. and, and also the, the enthusiasm is around the same thing. Where does this lack of enthusiasm for Joe Biden, you think, comes from? Because actually, I mean, just to be honest, I'm, and, and not uh, to be an ideologue, because I'm not, Believe it or not, um, the economy is actually pretty good. Yeah, you know, and you know, we're actually Biden has done a lot of things to help people. He's not perfect. No administration is. Every every administration makes mistakes. Um, what What do you think? Why hasn't Why hasn't that being you know, What's the yeah. word? Why aren't American people absorbing that or feeling that? I you know this is and I may be completely wrong here, but it's my theory, which is 
we're kind of the he's kind of the victim of the United States having such a good economy for so long, with the exception of of COVID and but COVID was explainable, um, and we came back really fast. I mean, really since the Great Recession, if you think about it, the United States has had a growing, vibrant economy. You know. And I think we've just, that's kind of baked in now that the economy is always going to be good. If we're coming off a recession, then I think people feel it better and feel it differently. But yeah, I think right now we're kind of the victim of just, it's been good for so long. What now? There's a, there's another issue too, which is the, you know, the fundraisers, the, <clears throat> the messengers, they've all determined that the economy doesn't drive dopamine hits. Dopamine hits are driven by cultural outrages, yeah. by, you know, the attack on the border. They're mm -hmm. the latest outrage you saw or that, you know, here's a video of some uh, African-American beating up a white kid on the street, which I see all the time, by the way, now on Twitter, which is like people just trying I to do a, a lot. Right. Yeah. yeah. Trying to trying bait to this race. The, yes. Yes. It, it's crazy. The trans issue. They yeah. do these wedge sort of wedge cultural issues that and, you know, I, I talked the other day about uh, the trans issue. It's such a small percentage of the yeah. population. Yeah. And, that, and they brought yeah. more attention to this trans visibility day than anything. What about when it comes to what about Roe v. Wade, though? Do you think because that was supposed to be a big issue that was going to help Joe Biden is going to help the Democrats? Do you think it still is? I do. I think it's going to be helpful for the Democrats. I think um, I mean, look, all you have to look at is this Alabama special election. It's these little like elections you see before the big election that usually can kind of give a sense of, of where the energy is. Um, and I think the biggest thing, look. If this was just a matter of a hey, Republicans wanted Roe versus Wade gone, Wade gone, it's gone. Now we're going to leave everything to the states to decide. I don't think it's as powerful of an issue at that point for the Democrats, but the Republicans cannot help themselves to now talk. I mean, IVF is being banned for, yeah. you know, in Alabama. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when I was in Congress that we were actually pushing for the military to cover IVF because, you know, the, yeah. you, pro family, right? And uh, those are the things that I think are going to gin up the base. So I think the Democrats are right to use this, particularly on a state-by-state -state basis. And I think it's going to work in their favor. I don't know if it's a panacea. So I think if there's this idea that we need to just run an entire national nationwide election on abortion, I'm not sure that's going to be right. But I do think it's going to be an issue that works for them. The other thing, Don, that I think they've got to do is you can't lose Ukraine. Uh, Joe Biden has to show some foreign policy wins here. Because I think the sense about Biden, right or wrong, is that, you know, look, this race, this election is about evil versus weak. And Joe Biden's weak. Donald Trump is evil. Joe Biden, you know, look, we had the shameful withdrawal from Afghanistan, which even I'm still bitter about. Uh, Ukraine is fighting to a stalemate at this point. We, you know, what's going on in Israel? We'll figure out in the next few months that the Houthis are attacking the Red Sea and we're kind of fighting back, kind of not. He's got to, if we get this aid bill done, show a real fire to give Ukraine what it needs. May not win by November, but to be back on the offense. I think they're underestimating how important Ukraine is to, for instance, the Haley Republicans that are still not voting for Trump, but are waiting for kind of a carrot from the, from the Biden administration. Wow, that's interesting that you, you say that you think it's Ukraine, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about Israel a, a little bit. But you think Israel, I mean, Ukraine more so than Israel? I think for the Haley voters, yes. And I think for the broad, like, kind of foreign policy win, I think it's Ukraine. Because I think Ukraine is, honestly, I think it's actually the most important foreign policy event in my entire lifetime, even, even mm -hmm. over the collapse of the Soviet Union, because this determines if the, if the post-World War II order survives or not. That's my wow. opinion. Okay. Uh, let's talk Israel since we're here now. Yeah. Um, the war in Gaza is, is looming over President Biden. You know, you know that. You said he needs a foreign policy win. More than 30,000 Palestinians have died, 13,000 children. Human rights organizations are warning of widespread famine. The question is lately, and I don't know if you saw Jon Stewart on the, um, on the Daily Show the other night. The question is, has Israel gone too far? Look, I, it's tough because let, let me explain... When we went into, and I, I will directly answer that, but I've got to start with this. When we went after ISIS, okay, and we went into Mosul, Mosul is the best example. We destroyed Mosul. The city was destroyed, was leveled, flattened. That's how you defeat an enemy in an urban environment. Now, the difference is in Mosul, 
people were able to flee to other areas. So basically what you had is civilians left, and what was left in Mosul were ISIS fighting. And so, yes, you had to destroy houses and buildings to kill ISIS. And we did it. Uh, we with the Iraqi army. In Gaza, the real, where I give a lot of criticism to, quite honestly, is Egypt and Jordan that have closed their border to Gaza. So you have a population that is unable to flee. And now you have Israel with frankly, the same determination we had with ISIS, which is we have to wipe out Hamas. Now, that said, Israel has done a terrible job in messaging. They've done a terrible job in talking about the importance of strategic strikes going from the opening phases of the war. The opening phases are going to be very violent, very deadly, to kind of counterterrorism or counterinsurgency phases now, which is when you have to win hearts and minds of the population. You may not win the hearts and minds of the population, but that's what you have to transition to. So I would say Israel is right to want to destroy Hamas. Like, I mean, if I was the prime minister of Israel, I'd still be outraged by October 7th. But I think they have to do a better job of talking about and truly turning to a counterinsurgency, counterterrorism type model and uh, I don't think they've made that clear yet. And frankly, I'm not sure if Netanyahu knows what it is that he has in mind and what he wants to do. There's this feeling that he's extending this war so that he survives politically. I don't know if that's true or not. That's a very cynical take. Um, if it's not true, he needs to make it very clear what his goal is because they are losing the messaging war. And let me tell you, losing the messaging war is almost as serious as losing the actual ground war. Well, at the very beginning of this, um, I was talking to folks about the um, PR war and that it was, it, it's, it was a tightrope for Israel. Mm -hmm. And who wouldn't be outraged? And it's also very emotional for, for Jewish people. And one can understand that. Um, I was watching an interview, Adam, with um, Jose Andres from World Central Kitchen. And he said, this is no longer about October 7th. I don't know if I agree with that. But what do you make of his comments? Obviously, he is very emotional considering what happened to his workers, the international aid workers as well. Yeah, I mean, I well understand his emotion. I think, you know, look, I, I, I disagree with that this is no longer about October 7th. I mean, again, let's take 9-11. Let's take ISIS. You know, we prosecuted a multi-year war. As a, and ISIS still exists, by the way, and they're growing, and we may have to re-engage them at some point soon. Um, and so, like, look, a, a counterinsurgency, counterterrorism type action takes a long time. You know, Hamas was allowed to basically thrive in Gaza for a while. But I, I, I'm not going to fault for what Jose Andres said because, like, I, I mean, obviously, what a tragic moment for him and a huge mistake by Israel. I mean, everything I understand is they actually checked in at a Israeli checkpoint. You know, they, were, they had uh, their convoy was well marked. Uh, this is a problem, and I'm a big fan of the Guard and Reserves in the United States of America. This is one of the problems. It's a pretty brilliant model that the <clears throat> Israelis use with their reserves because obviously small country, huge reserves. But the problem is you bring a lot of people into a combat situation that frankly have not trained in depth in a very long time. And so they're not 24 hours a day being hit with, hey, watch your target, be careful, this and this. And you end up with a lot of guys that may be accountants that are now sitting behind you know, the, the combat power of a drone that make bad decisions. Yeah. Let's, uh, you know, you, there's uh, also aid. You talked about aid to Ukraine. Um, even as Biden has criticized Netanyahu for inflicting civil casualties in Gaza, he is requesting $14 billion in aid for Israel. Do you think it is, do you think that's appropriate? Do you, and do you think at, at some way... Is it time for the U.S. to change um, its, I don't know how to, to change its approach to Israel? Because certainly, uh, you said the PR war, they're losing. Yeah, uh, no. And, and public sentiment a, as well, I think, is that tide is starting to turn. But do you think it's time to change its approach to Israel? No, look, I think Israel, like outside of this, the Gaza war, Israel plays a very important role, which is, you know, look, it's an anchor in a pretty tough area of the Middle East. You know, it's obviously takes a lot of the ire of Iran. Iran would be focusing a lot more of their ire on the United States if they didn't have Israel to do it. Israel has to stand up in a tough neck of the woods, a tough neighborhood. But I also am not one of these people that believes we need to just write a check to Israel and let them do whatever they want to do. 
I mean, there is conditions that come with aid. We're conditioning aid to Ukraine, which I actually disagree with these conditions, but I understand them where we're saying no American aid can be used to attack into Russia. Um, conditioning aid is not, it's really only Israel that we don't have any conditions on. So I think it's okay to say we're going to condition some of this. We're going to go through, but we need to be very careful to all of a sudden tell Israel how to fight this war. Um, and then also to say, like, we're not going to give you money anymore because it's a violent war. Look, it's violence. And every country needs to know this. If you inflict un if you inflict violence on a country, there is never a time in history where that country did not inflict a lot more violence on you. It's the tragedy of war. Japan got hit a lot worse than they inflicted on us uh, in, in Hawaii. And that's just the nature. Germany ended up taking a lot more of the impact of the war than they put on the UK. That's what happens when you start a fight. I appreciate you talking about this. This is a tough conversation it to is. talk about. Yeah. It is. It's, it is. Uh, and because I don't think people understand the intricacies of what's happening uh, in Israel. And, and you comparing it to other conflicts with similar terrorist organizations, I think, puts it in a very good uh, perspective for people to at least to try to understand and, and, and get away from the emotion, if you can. Yeah. It, it is a very emotional thing. True. Let's talk about, uh, before you go, before I let you go, Adam Kinzinger, I want to talk mm -hmm. about the Supreme Court uh, and the, this immunity trial that oh. it's set to look at next month. Former president is arguing that he is immune to prosecution from any crimes committed while in office. What do you expect the outcome of this case to be? Well, I think, well, I'm sad that they took it up because all, all this does is delay, and this is ex exactly what Donald Trump wants, right? Let's just be clear. But... I think it's going to be 9-0 or 8-1 with Justice Thomas being the one whose wife obviously was, you know, helping on January 6th mm -hmm. legally. It's just she was doing her First Amendment, but it's still outrageous. Yes. But uh, anyway, I, I think Conflict that's going of to, interest. I, totally. I think that's going to be the result. I just want to point out how ludicrous the argument is. Now, if you believe that the president has total immunity... At the same time, Republicans are trying to impeach Joe Biden. Let's think about this. They're right. claiming that Donald Trump has total immunity and trying to impeach Joe Biden. They have no evidence of anything to impeach Joe Biden on. Joe Biden can't be impeached for anything if you believe a president has total immunity, right? Because everything he does is legal. Joe Biden, you cannot, I mean... Donald Trump's lawyers argued that in theory, a president could have SEAL Team 6 kill his political opponent. There is no oh. incentive for a president to ever leave office because all you have to do is make illegal orders, but you're immune. So good luck. And if you <laughs> fail, you fail. You're immune. If you succeed, you're in office. And by the way, the United States of America fought a revolution against unelected leaders and against leaders that were above uh, the criminal code. So this is insane and it's entire, and, but the problem is it has succeeded in buying time. And that is the only goal that Donald Trump has. One more thing. There's this whole thing going around about Sonia Sotomayor mm -hmm. that she should retire and not allow, you know, the members or at least someone from your former party. Well, not your former party, someone from the Republican party have an opportunity to choose another justice for the court. Do you think that she should retire? I, I mean, she doesn't strike me as that old. I mean, I yeah, guess... It's, she's like 60-something. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm like, wait, what, what are you... You know, Mehdi Hassan, I like Mehdi, but I'm like, why? Yeah, I mean, if she was in her 80s, like, I, you know, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg was obviously older. I get that, but... And I get that concern, but Sonia Sotomayor is fairly young. I, I guess, like, it's it's for her decision to make, but in my mind, look, if Donald Trump wins... I think there will be a Republican president for four years. And then there, I think there is almost no way that after another Trump term that Republicans can win the presidency again. So I think everybody needs to take a deep breath. That said, you know, I'll let her make that decision. Yeah, I, I agree. It should be her decision. I understand. Listen, I understand the argument, but mm -hmm. to, you know, tell like a, a, a woman, um, a right. Latino woman who is iconic and has made history to, that she should retire is, I think, is a, you know, is a little... It's a bridge much. too far. Yep. Yeah, it's a bridge too far. So, uh, listen, I always ask you, did you, you know, I talked about the things I found important. Did you talk about the things, all the things you thought, think are important? I did. And I'll tell you, I think, again, I, not to overstate it, but I, I don't think it can be overstated. I think these, this next, 
you know, the next month or two when it comes to Ukraine is really going to determine, honestly, what, what kind of a world my kid lives in. It's going to determine what kind of a world America finds itself in. And, uh, and this, all this lies in just a few Republicans and, uh, and Mike Johnson. And I hope we do the right thing because I got to tell you, if, if the Russians win, America's role in the world, America's credibility in the world is just collapsed and the post-World War II order is over. And we will live in a kind of pre-World War II dark ages where power rules the day. And I, I don't want to live like that. I, I've got to tell you, this is what I wanted my conversation for with Elon Musk to be like. Because remember, we were on separate sides. That's what, at least that's what we thought, right? I worked for CNN. Everyone thinks CNN is is liberal, and you are re, a Republican congressman. I think it's important for people to, to see us having a conversation right. so that they can do it as well. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's look. Here's the thing: politics and democracy was invented because people disagree on stuff. And like, we have to have this disagreement. Look, I've moderated on things like guns, right? I've moderated on all these issues because people had a different view than me and I was willing to listen and be like, you know what? Yes, that makes sense. There's no shame in changing your view and there's no shame in listening to somebody else's view and having a respectful disagreement. But we've just turned into everything as you have to own the other side and that's the only way to be cool. It's too bad. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Thank you, sir. I you appreciate bet. you joining us. Come back anytime, okay? You be well. Absolutely. You too. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for watching The Don Lemon Show. Make sure you click on the image in the top right to subscribe to my channel and the thumbnail in the bottom right to watch more content from my show. And I'll see you next time.